All righty. Really wish I could make my screen a better resolution, but yes. That's photo reels are just working from pieces of photo, you know, and then composing. So photo reels. I mean, there's lots of different terms for what what they are, but. I, I think the term photo reel means that it looks as real as a photo, you know, in part. I'm sure there's lots of different ways to interpret that, but I would call it a rendering. I don't know where I, where I picked up the phrase photo reel. I don't really like it very much. So when we last left off last week, um, we were working on this bird's eye of the Life Source campus just off of the Mississippi River. Um, and you can find in the to take folder, this is the class six one, the bird's eye base. I believe there should be a base already prepared in case somebody wasn't here last week and doesn't have this folder. So you can start it up um, with the composite PNGs already. There again, you know, looking at these PNGs, it's really important to always think about how you're exporting out of the model. And so we will go over that in, at length. Alrighty, but I'm going to start off with where we left off, which was we had done some nice textures to the grass. Not that nice of textures, but we had started to put some decent textures in there. Okay. And so to further that a little bit, I wanted to show a couple of techniques with regards to making those grasses jump a little bit more. Um, we had created these textures via clone stamping a bunch of various, let's go back to vegetation, a bunch of various images. So for instance, we had taken the grass clumps, I believe here, and turned it into that. We had taken, we had made this grass, or I had made that grass texture by clone stamping, um, taken that fescue and made that. That is just an expansion of this. So getting at the scale of things that we need. So just to start off, I want to just reiterate that by going to one more image, which was this one. And if you see the, the other views that I, that I sent around that I did, I had to do an alternate take of this, and it had to have more of a, a prairie aesthetic. Um, the advantage of this, too, of, of, you, of starting from an actual like meadow scene is that then if you have to do an alternate version, um, of a sort of a ground level view, then you can use that exact same texture. So for, ex for example, here we have the ground eye level view. As soon as it pulls up. Computer. Well, the point is to show that it's advantageous. Come on, computer. You know you love me. There you are. OK. So in the alternate version, because I base my bird's eye on an existing sort of perspective view of, of vegetation, I'm able to sort of reuse that in the scene. And the same thing with the, uh, with the other version, with the other view, the, uh, the grass tufts on the hillsides. Maybe this will load quicker. Yeah, that loads quicker. So that's the exact same texture over here that I use in the bird's eye. And then the same textures that I can use here, I use in the bird's eye. And then in the end, I actually just created this bench, didn't model it, and reuse that in the bird's eye. So swip, switching back and forth. So. so to reiterate, I'm going to open up class six, vegetation, find my nice meadow, open in CS6, CS5, CS6. We're going to turn this, turn this into a texture by duplicating it. 
and then clone stamping the heck out of it. I have discovered that I've always wondered what the benefit of uh, autofill is or the um, content aware fill is. And actually creating textures, it's quite nice um, because it sometimes it guesses right. This time I'm going to ignore that, but um, I'm just going to do it by hand because I like the perspective. So I delete the top. For the sake of it, I'm just going to stretch this up, clone stamp it a little bit. I actually want to spread the horizon line off a little bit and then make it less iterative. So this is one I will be able to utilize in my ground eye view level. Less uh, when I start to tile it, it won't look like little cubes. Iterative in that it's just um, something I duplicated side to side, and therefore, here I'll show you um, by opening it up and making it really big. I'm going to, I duplicate to a new file, my favorite technique for working with something, and this time I'm going to make the canvas size very large. It's already huge, but we're just going to make it crazy big now. And instead of duplicate, well, no, so if, if I just did this, this would look iterative. As soon as I spread it onto the landscape, that would look pretty crappy because it would just look like a bunch of tiled junk. But if I clone stamp it, then I can get away. I hit S to clone stamp. I start to go like this. And, and this is where sometimes it can take a really long time um, to get a really nice texture, but it's always worth it. But you want to be um, aware of two different things. Number one, the content aware, which will help us fill this in very quickly in just a second. But if you are clone stamping, you need to be very uh, cognizant of the type of brush you are using. I'm using a, a, a brush with a soft edge right now. I don't actually always recommend that for this application because what ends up happening is that it sometimes looks a little too blurry. So like right here, I'm, I'm losing some of the definition as I, as I clone stamp over, over myself and it, it kind of creates these blurry edges. So you actually, if you can get away with it, um, it doesn't look too splotchy depending on your texture, it is better to use a very hard edge just because it creates much better distinction in the grass blades. And when you're working at a scale of a bird's eye, this is better. Because if it's too blurry, it'll just be blurry. OK, so that was enough work. I want to do this faster. So I am going to use my handy dandy content aware trick. I grab my magic lasso and make a very large selection. Get the marching ants, and then all I have to do is right click on there and say fill. It will ask me how do I like, like to fill this. I can fill it with a foreground color, the background color, a regular color, um, but I'm just going to use the default, which is content wear. Hit OK. See how smart it is. Really considers its life. It always works great on skies if you have a bird in the sky that you think is really ugly and want content to wear it out because you're too lazy to clone stamp it. That works great. But, oh, I've made this angry. Way too big is the answer. Um, and that is why it's very angry at me right now. I'm going to force quit it. But I'll show you really quick on a different one. Well, while this is thinking about itself, everybody go online and find a nice little blue stem vegetation. 
We're going to use that in a second. Anybody have any great stories from this week? How can you guys not be storytellers? This is really disturbing. There's like so many of you. Nobody had something interesting. No revelations on your capstone. Nothing funny that Vince said. A video of what? Uh, I'm trying to think of the craziest thing we did. What was the craziest thing we did in the studio, honey? No, no, we made like what was that thing Nat made? Okay, so now I'm gonna I'm just, now I'm making a very very small selection because I'm terrified of the content we're right now, and I make it just a selection. Right click. I should say fill. I have to select a layer, and then say fill. Content aware, hit OK, and there you go. It interpreted, it interpreted the landscape and filled it in. As you can see, it sort of flip flopped in a little bit. You know, it looks like it sampled a hair from. I mean, it's always interesting to try to figure it out. It's like, okay, I see a dot, dot, dot. Do I see that somewhere else? Yeah, maybe like. No, I don't know what that is. Maybe from over here somewhere. Maybe that cluster is that cluster. And so it's actually quite smart in the way that it doesn't make it iterative. Exactly. Yes. It looks really awful. And sometimes it looks really awful. But I did what you did. Just now? Yes. Well, well you did it wrong. I, no, I did, I did the, uh, the big one. Oh, you did the big one? Yeah. yeah. But it looks like, like vomit. So, <laughs> so there, we don't like vomit. But, you know, you have to sort of go slow. You have to get to know it. You have to warm it up a little bit. Um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's a magical, magical thing that takes a lot of luck, in my opinion. But I have learned that if you have a very consistent graphic, sometimes it can work really well. And it can save you a lot of time. So that's content where blurs the edges really nice sometimes. Don't save. So I'm going to go back to my working file, and I'm going to open up a new blue stem texture. I'm just going to download a blue stem texture to my desktop and open it up into Photoshop. And I'm also going to just go back to my working file, and we're going to duplicate this over to our working file. And we're going to just use the color of the blue stem to color our grass to make it look like blue stem. So I duplicate the little blue stem texture over to my number one PSD. Here we go. I've got blue stem. It's sure out of scale, but I don't care. All I care about is the color. I need to be iterative with it. And so let's see, Mr. Content Aware, if you work this time. That's I'm not gonna be that risky. I'm just selecting an area over my grass because that's what I'm going to want to fill. Nice. I'm not going to be risky, and I'm just going to be lazy and duplicate it. It doesn't even matter that I'm being lazy. Okay, and now I'm going to merge together all of those layers, all of the blue stem layers. Um, because when we were working on the grass, 
we used a layer mask, it's really easy to use that exact same layer mask to apply that to the blue stem. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to hold Command on my Mac and right click the layer mask, and that creates a selection. Um, you, can, you can do that for anything, I believe. Um, if I came down here, I turn my building on, I right click the building, or I, I'm sorry, I Command clicked the building, it makes a selection of that building. But it's very handy for layer masks. So I right click, or I Command click my layer mask. And now I move back up to my blue stem. And because now I have to create a layer mask by clicking my little doomhickey down there. And I've got uh, not so good of a texture, but using our blending modes by switching around, we can actually start to see how we get the color, the, sat, the, the color of the blue stem is able to sort of shine on through, but the texture of the, of the grass clumps that we added um, also, like that, that sort of perspective that we, we already sort of imbued into the, the drawing is showing up really nicely. Um, we can emphasize that more by, you know, adding a, even more textural uh, grass. Um, I could duplicate this grass clumps actually, and, and I'm going to, you know, do do my favorite thing, which is bumping up that brightness and contrast. Maybe down with the brightness, but up with the contrast. Just playing around with it until I get a really nice texture that's, that shines on through. The other nice thing about doing this, this uh, layering of, of using just the color of the blue stem is that you, get, you therefore also get away from that iterative sense um, by adding another texture adding something else that has a variety of color spreading across it. You know, it's starting to get some really interesting hues at different spots um, that makes it very unique. So to this effect, too, because, we're in a, because we are in a, uh, in a layer mask, and say we, this was a very, very high resolution image, we can always jump in here turn these guys off, and then grab a brush and choose a nice grass brush. Choose my layer mask. Choose my grass brush. Okay, let's see my color. My color is white. That's good. And I can start to draw along this edge ever so slightly to soften. The edge. These little nuances are really what makes a big difference in the long run. Because as I start to fill in the uh, path with aggregate, that's when it's going to really need this extra love. So it doesn't look like just a really harsh image. Here again, layer masks are so great for this ability. Um, something weird is happening though. You guys all see how when I draw this brush on here, what's hap anybody knows kind of what's, what's wrong with this brush? What's that? Yeah, it is because this brush is set to jitter. Anybody know what, a, what jittering is on the, on the brushes? Go to our, go to our brush uh, presets. Um, under the window brush, you get to your presets of your brushes. This is a very powerful tool. Um, if you know how to use it. As you can see, as with everything in Photoshop, it's a huge range of dynamics of things that you can do. Um, in the case of the brush, or the grass brush, we're all used to it. It's, it's set up, it's, it's, it's free when you get Photoshop, um, and it has all these, these settings. And you, you start to see what's happening down here. If you go through and you click shape dynamics off, then all of a sudden it has no shape dynamics. That is to say that it's the exact same grass over and over and over. Um, scattering takes away that randomness, which we like both of those things. The shape dynamics, though, sometimes the shape dynamics are way too much. That is when they go side to side to side to side, and that's annoying. And the way you change that is uh, by looking at the angle jitter. So I could really increase it, and it could spin it around. You could do some really kind of crazy cool things. Um, I could actually see how this could be really nice if I was doing, say, shadows, like nighttime shadows, where the light was coming from all these different angles, and I wanted to create very disparate if I had a uh, a person brush, um, if I was really getting crazy, then you could, you could create these sort of crazy shadows. Today, I don't really care. 
I don't want that kind of a jitter. That's way too much. I'm just going to turn it way down. And then we've got some other ones we want to check out. And the one that's most relevant to what we were just talking about is the color dynamics. Now, color dynamics is on. Now, normally, color dynamics is off on brushes, hence that if you're using uh, a circle brush and it's on white, you just get white. Well, color dynamics are on. It bounces back and forth between the two colors. So when it's on, it's bouncing between white and black. And the brightness jitter just sort of adjusts that slightly. And so what happens when you bounce between black and white on a mask is it's masking and then de taking the mask away, and then masking and then taking the mask away. And so, so that's why it's looking gray down here. So what you actually need to do is change this black to white or turn my color dynamics off. Now when I go over it, it's always going to show up. Now those color dynamics can be great if you're painting you know, two different colors and you want two different tones of green on your grass. You know, <laughs> set, set those, you know, your, your two different color tones to two different ones and it works really fabulously. But I would never paint grass. Why? Because I would just use my, I would clone stamp it. Or I would use a mask on a grass texture and then use this, this technique. No point in doing destructive things when you can be non-destructive. Who likes destruction? Okay, so layers. Did we get to the aggregate? Yeah, it looks like we did last week. A little bit. Okay, so last week we showed how to add aggregate, and then we also showed how to use the filter and um, add noise. That's a very important one. Um, there's other techniques for adding noise that I think are, are relevant. Um, also using the filter and then pixelate, mezz mezzo tinte. Um, there was somebody who was having issues with the rain tutorial and the snow tutorial, and um, playing around with diff different techniques of using noise or the mezzo tint uh, pixelation is very valid. So I just wanted to note that. All right, now let's talk about trees. Trees in the bird's eye are essential, uh, as with everything, to think about light lighting quality, and also thinking about not being iterative. So let's go to our class folder and open up some trees. Hmm. So last week I also showed how a lot of the times when I'm doing a tree, I might actually just, in, in a bird's eye, I might just use the shape of the tree and set it up and then start to paint on the, uh, the, the crown of the tree, such as the, the canopy, such as using these techniques. And so I just want to show you in a, in a, in a different uh, sort of window how to do that. But this rendering that we're working on, this bird's eye, it, it didn't really apply when I started doing it. I used a different one. So, so we'll go through both techniques. Um, so number one, let's open up. Let's just open up this one. This honey locust looks decent. Honey locust, honey dash locust.jpg. So I'm going to duplicate it and use some of my handy dandy techniques to get rid of the blue and everything else. Uh, my favorite one usually is select color range. Select a nice in-between blue. It's got a ton of contrast, so I should have no issue. Hit OK, 200. That is going to work great. Tweak it up, I'm lazy. Actually, I'm going to use my pen tool because I have to use some good techniques. Does everybody have a make selection hotkey set up on their computer? Yeah. What is it? <laughs> What's that? P. Really? P? That's the pen tool. Yeah. <laughs> What's the point of having a make selection from pen if you can't even get to the pen tool? Well, now I can't remember mine. What is mine? I don't have one. <laughs> Shucks. Now I don't know mine. I just keep switching back and forth between computers. Um, well, if you don't have one, then you can just go down here to go to your path menu, which pops up here. You can go to window path and then click make selection. You can right click on work path too. You can? Yeah. 
Wow, that's even better. Right click, make selection. Okay, well I didn't even need a hot key if I can get right click tool. Okay, make selection and delete. Those are pretty awesome, not gonna lie. Don't forget, edit, keyboard shortcuts, and you can add any hotkey you want when you start using something over and over. Okay. Sorry, can you go over that select column? Yeah, no problem. Please, please, do stop me if I am doing something too fast. Um, so, I'm going to duplicate that guy. Select color range. Now when you make a selection of the color range, it gives you this little pop-out menu. Um, and so what this is doing is just giving me a couple of different options. The default options work really well. I just pick a color, and as you can see, it's changing depending on which blue I'm selecting over here. And that's also in response to my fuzziness. Fuzziness is a dumb word. I don't know why they use that, but... It's a lot of things got established early in Photoshop that just stuck around because people got used to them. Um, and as you see, when I change the fuzziness, what you're recognizing here is a mask, a black and white mask. Um, and so say I hit that, and the more I go up, the more I, the fuzziness, the tolerance goes up. I hit OK. And the white is what's going to be deleted, and the black is what's going to stay. And I can always, from here, go... I should have my Refine Edges tool. Does anybody have Refine Edges popping up? Well, does it pop up then? Yeah. Well, in, this, in a very similar circumstance when you're using the magic wand and you, have contiguous, and you have contiguous off and you have a very high tolerance, and you can use Refine Edges. It's a very similar sort of way to view it. This time, I'm viewing it. Marching Ants would show me where my selection is. Overlay, that is to say that red is all the things I would be keeping. Everything blue or another color would be going away. On black, is thinking about it like a mask. On white, also thinking about a mask. Just giving you different options to look at. If this was white on white, then that'd be really good because anything that wasn't white would be something you would want to find a way to get rid of. Um, so just considering how the computer is, is thinking about these is really good. Like uh, you know, on layers, that is exactly what will be deleted. Is it what you want to be deleted? Cool. Good. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yeah, just color select. So working within this, let me check out my canvas size. So I'm going to check out my image size because my Resolution is probably pretty low. Yeah, I'm just going to bump up my resolution to 300. For the sake of working within this graphic. I don't know why this is making my computer angry. And uh, shrink that down by hitting Command negative command plus to zoom up the whole zooming thing um, quick question uh, when you zoom does everybody like to go like create a box and zoom in or do you prefer when you drag and zoom in or do you prefer to hold the alt option and zoom in or the command plus and zoom in let's take a vote Command plus and command negative. Okay, that's a lot. Who uses the alt scroll wheel? Oh, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, that's saying a lot. Um, this is where you just drag it sideways? Oh, any box zoomers? No? No scrubby or box zoomers? Anybody know the hotkey for this scrubby box zoomer? Um, I like the box a lot. I got used to the box, probably because I wasn't a mouse guy for a long time. And the box, you just hold command, uh, space bar, and then you can create a box. And anyway, okay, that's an aside. But if you were between those two, it's, it's I think, very interesting to note that the scrubby zoom slash box zoom is up here. There you go. Okay, you guys are no fun. 
real theory. All righty. So my image is fairly good size. I'm going to jump my canvas up just a little bit bigger so I have a little bit more to work with. Let's jump my, my width up to 20. All righty. And now that my image is huge and I've quadrupled, I've upsampled this tree four times, I can shrink it down with great confidence. That's going to be fine. Now, I really care about this image. I really care about what I'm going to be doing. And so I'm going to give this silhouette some love. Um, first of all, there might be some blue around the edges. And I don't want that. Right now, it doesn't seem like it's a big deal. But down the road, it could be a big deal. And so I'm going to go through and actually turn the hue saturation on via image adjustment hue saturation or command U. I'm going to drop that lightness all the way down. That makes it pretty much black. Just gets rid of everything. Um, another way to do it would be bright. Uh, well, another way to do it would be hue saturation and take all the saturation down. You're taking all the color out. So two different ways. You make black and white too. Any, any option is at your disposal. Um, for good measure, I kind of I recognize maybe there's a little halo in here. So I use the magic wand to get rid of any other sort of ghosting around there that might be popping up. It's just important to start off on the right foot. So, so I'm feeling good about this. So let's duplicate it and give it some love because we don't want identical twins. I want fraternal twins. I am going to start by any variety of techniques of using distortions and warps and clone stamps and creating a marquee box and dragging over and it seems like tediousness, but you know what? It's what makes it good. So I start by holding command on, grab my little box down there and I straighten it out a little bit. I'm going to make a selection using my, my lasso tool. I hit L, I grab this guy and make that branch smaller. And I say, heck with it. I'm going to flip that horizontal and drag it over here. And it's got a new branch there. And same thing with this one. I'm going to kind of make a selection of this. Hot key for warp. I'm going to warp it a little bit. I could use my puppet warp. I could use liquify. Any number of things to get this tree to really start to read like a different tree. But the advantage here is that, you know, you're starting with the same tree. And so it's going to have the same quality. It's going to have, you know, if, if it actually was a tree that had color to it, it would uh, still look like it was there from the same day, et cetera. So that's not hugely different, but you can, you can really start to see how you can flip it horizontally. That's not enough. As you can see, if I put those trees next to each other, it would look really goofy. But once you do that, um, you can warp it a little bit, selectively delete. But the important thing here is give it some love. Clone stamping is a really good one. Here again, I would recommend not using a soft brush, but using a hard brush. Sorry, clone stamp by hitting S. smaller, use my bracket tool to go a little bit smaller, make a little selection up here, fill that in, fill that in a little bit there. So these techniques are very, very applicable to many, 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 many trees and will pay dividends in the end. So, so I've got three trees. I'm going to copy those now. They don't look hugely different, but that's OK. Life will go on. Just pretend like we just did a lot more work. Make them skinnier, make them taller. All right. Happy with that. Go back to my working folder, and this time go to the trees, and I'm going to find, uh, let's go with forest canopy. 
Yeah, or maybe Canopy 2. Canopy 2. I like Canopy 2. Open to Photoshop. <clears throat> And duplicate over to the honey locust. And you can pick any old canopy. You know, something with high resolution is fabulous. But here, here I just make it to a nice resolution, pull it up here. And the technique, as it is going to be, is a lot more clone stamping. Um, in this case, we can try a different variety of brushes because something with a hard edge is not necessarily going to be the best. But, you know. Let's, let's try some different things out. Start off with uh, clone stamping. I hit the letter S to get the clone stamp. And let's look at our brush options. Um, I would normally maybe create even a special brush for something like this, but this watercolor brush looks kind of cool. Or maybe this one. Or, ooh, I got this guy here. That looks really nice. Let's try that. And now, I'm being a little bit literal. I, I don't even want to do that, actually. I don't want to lead you guys on to thinking that that's the key. Um, it's not. The key, is, the key is being meticulous in your technique. So. so make that selection. And all we're doing is clone stamping a little bit here. Pulling it over. Selecting different spots. Just as a painter, I'd paint on the crowns of trees and start to see a nice variety. I'll move this up to the top so you can see it in conjunction. That's how it would really look. Um, now I'm going to go back, maybe choose something with a soft brush. And start to feather the edges. You know, if I really wanted to be meticulous, I could do a different crown for every tree. But the advantage of this is when, as, as I showed with that um, River First um, birds I did last week, um, when you're doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trees, you don't want to do a special crown for every single tree. You just want to do this. You want to just paint on a little bit of, of, of crown for everybody. And the other nice thing about that is then when I start to get in and use some different techniques uh, with bl layer blend modes, um, it affects all of them at the same time. I don't have to merge them. You know, I don't even have the temptation to have individual crowns for everybody because that's what ends up happening is you, have, you want to do individual crowns for everything and then it's just not even worth it plus it just took you two extra hours. So, so that's, that's pretty good. Um, but I really wanted to start to read a little bit better so that's where the layer, layer blend modes and then thinking about the lighting quality is going to pay off. So let's finish this up. You know, normally I'd get in and delete it around but... At this scale, at a bird's eye scale, most of the time it doesn't really matter. So, duplicate that, and I'm going to delete my sort of extra from my primary one. And I'm going to turn off my old one just so I just so I have it as a backup. Zoom in to see a little bit better, and now let's try a couple of different techniques. Let's duplicate it first of all, and uh, try some let blend modes. See what happens. Multiply actually does kind of look nice. Color burn, linear burn, lighten, screen. You know, go through these different blend modes to see what is starting to make the most sense for you. Um, overlay always adds a nice vibrancy to it, especially if you uh, decrease the opacity. Because you do want to see the uh, the branching of the trees. So I just went to, between the two layers, the, the lower one, and dropped the opacity down to 30%. I've got overlay on this one. And it, you know, it's starting to read like very distinct trees. Um, another great technique is to add a layer for lightning. So I'm going to add a new layer. <laughs> I'm just dragging this window up because my computer the screen is very annoying and I can't maximize it. So add in a new layer and I'm going to just create a really dumb box on the crowns of these trees. Because of the scale of a bird's eye, you don't notice these things. And I, I showed this last week how you could have just like a big box here and uh, nobody would even notice. Make, make path. I'm going to grab my paint bucket by hitting the letter G and select a nice sort of yellow color. 
paint bucket that in. Cool, drop the opacity, then change the lighten, soft light, hard light, no, vivid light, no, I think soft light's the best. And then make a layer mask, or just erase. In this case, I'll be lazy and erase because I don't feel like going to the layer mask thing. And going through, and I just lightened the tops a little bit. And that's actually what they would look like a lot more. Um, in, a, in a more ground eye level view of, of a tree, what I would do instead of doing this technique, this is just good for very, very large bird's eyes. Um, because guess what, you really wouldn't, you, you can see how there's this little line. But as I showed you last week, by opening one of those up, there was like some really distinct lines all over that image and your eye never picks them up. Because your eye, it, you give it an excuse to see something, it's going to see what you give it that excuse to see. Um, not the nuance. But nevertheless, say I didn't do this, say I was um, being very meticulous in my tree, what I would do is go to the bottom layer and use the burn and saturate, and the, the burn, sorry, the burn and dodge tools. So I would dodge out the tops by adding some lightness to the tops, very lightly, and then go to my burn. Burn out the bases because they'd be dark on the underside, especially if you're using top canopies. You want to make sure that you know there's a shadow on the underside of trees. This is super important. As I every I say everything is super important, but this is really important. How do you guys make fun of me behind my back? Like, is it like a, like do you ever mock my love for Photoshop? I, I make fun of it. So, okay. So there you go. A quick little shot at at how to get in there. All right. Um. It's, it's a good note that you can use these very same techniques on things, on, on trees to create like a plan view tree. Like we all, like you probably have a pretty good arsenal of, of plan view trees, but I've given you all an amazing collection of honey locusts. Now here is an example of I used one honey locust tree to make four slightly different honey locust trees. They're not like crazy different, but they're different enough that they won't look um, ridiculous in, in a rendering. Um, but say I wanted to, I was going to do a plan rendering and of this exact same scene, and, and it's going to work great because I have all these textures, these 2D textures that are, I've already made and just, cl and just masked, um, put layer masks on, so I can take those over to my over to my plan, mask out all the areas, and they'll look perfect. They'll match my bird's eye perfectly. But all I need now is a plan view of a tree. And so I could open one of my trees and do the same thing. Duplicate it over and uh, get in here and start to do some nuancing. I want to do to treat it with great care. And so we know trees have two parts, leaves and uh, trunks. And so to start, I'm going to create the trunk by duplicating here, I'll delete out the majority of the leaves. I have to be like super careful, but great consideration. But duplicate that again. I'm going to use my little pointer because I, I'm, I'm going to spin this around and create a perfect circle. So I'm going to take my little pointer, move it to the center, and now It'll spin on that axis. Use my warp tool, warp it up a little bit. Hit duplicate one more time. Copy with that, select all three. I'm lazy, so I'm just going to merge them together. And then since they are to be the branches, I'm going to take it and drop the brightness and the contrast down. 
beef that up, and then nuance the edges a little bit more. <coughs> there we go. Now we're going to make the branching or the uh, the leaves. So I want to delete the trunk. And you know you could have skipped this the the dual steps, but I like being meticulous. I duplicate it, move my little pointer to the center, spin it around. Same thing, duplicate, pointer to the center, spin it around. Now that I have a very good base, I'll merge those three together. Jump in with the clone stamp. There again, I'm going to turn it off of the soft edges. I'm going to pick something a little bit harder, which might seem unintuitive because you'd click here and you'd see this like make a very distinct circle. But if you, if you get in there too much with a soft edge brush, it's just going to look muddled and you're going to lose all of that really great distinction that you have. So be careful. So it's better to clone stamp edges from edges. Then you get those distinct edges. Pull this up. There you go. That looks like a plan tree, if I've ever seen one. Maybe not, but I think so. Select that one, move it over to the center. I'm going to move my pointer to the part of it, drag it a little bit bigger by holding command, no, alt, whatever. I'll just move it back. Change the blend mode to screen, I think. No, not screen. Color dodge, no. Overlay, I don't know, just play around with it. Something that works. And the last but not least, because a plan, a tree and plan really would, uh, would have a lot more brightness on the crown on the tip. I would jump in with my burn, dodge my dodge tool, and really dodge the center. Get rid of most of those. Bad. Dodge the center away. I have a nice bright crown and then burn the edges, just so it has a little distinction. Maybe we have the sun coming from one side, which you probably would. And I would, you could add shadow to one side, and then add some light to the other side. You have a plan tree. Also, as you can see, it's all the same techniques pretty much over and over and over. Lots of clone stamping, lots of nuancing, lots of consideration for light. So, with my honey locust open, which I gave everybody, I'm going to select all of these guys, duplicate them over to my number one PSD, put them in here and then start to align them. Now because I set up my image with a bunch of different base layers, um, one of the first things I'm going to notice is like, ah, I'm working like, you know, if you look at the final one, it's like getting really complicated and there's aggregate and there's grass and there's people and I just can't see through the weeds. Um, that's kind of like a pun, but um, that's it. Um, anyway, uh, I would duplicate over to a new layer based on my baseline work. So my base plane is probably not what I want. I probably want my baseline work. So I would duplicate this to new. Go OK. Let's see. Yes, that has all my trees in here. So I can go back to my number one. Select my honey locusts. 
duplicate them over to my Untitled 2, which was the last one I just opened. And now in this sort of unto itself file, which I can just consider only about trees, I can get in here and I can start to place the trees in the right spot. Um, I can add my shadows in here for the trees. So I'm going to put all the bottoms at the right spots as they should be. Let me make larger. One, one thing that I was doing when I was making that plant tree that I think a lot of people skip that is quite handy when you're doing especially something like this and you're making things big and small all the time. And, and uh, I realized it also recently when I was trying to scale something. Um, I, had, I was working on a map, and I had an aerial view of a map, and then I took some vectored line work and I copied it over onto it. And that vectored line work was like 10 times too big. You know? So I had to shrink it down and try to align the roads and get it just right. Using the little pointer, the target, is really helpful for that. Because what I could do is find a, one intersection. I could find one intersection where the really big one crossed over the aerial view, put my little pointer, my little selector right here. In this case, I'm going to put it at the bottom of the tree. But I could put that right at that intersection, and then I could grab the very large one, and by holding is it shift or alt option, alt shift, and then shrinking, it shrinks it to that specific spot. And so that was a really quick way when you're doing it a lot to make sure that it's, it's transforming to the right spot. Same thing in this case with these trees. Like if I, if I shrink this one down, well, then it gets lost behind that other tree, and I got to go try to select it, and, and I accidentally select the wrong thing, and it's like in the wrong spot. So it's really annoying. But if I just drag the pointer down to the exact spot where it's supposed to be, and I align those two things, I can Alt-Shift it into the right spot. Change my arrangement of these trees. Really quick. Can you describe the rationale why you just wouldn't turn certain layers off in the original document to do this to work as opposed to putting it in the file? Because it gets really, really complicated. It just gets like you have too many layers. To turn them off, you mean? I mean, I don't know about your PSC files, but you know, when you're at a 1.5 gig file or something, you know, it's it's getting to a point where you have so many layers that um, and depending on the technique that you use of auto select or and show transform controls or not, um, and the scale of the image uh, just becomes something that it's it's hard to make auto select. Like for instance, if I'm clicking here, um, sometimes it's it's hard to actually grab the image because I grab the target. You know, it's, and so being able to work more with more nuance on the trees themselves. Makes a lot of sense. The other, the other issue is that you don't see, like because, because of all the other elements, you're not able to give the, the trees the consideration. And so that's why I always like to have like one file that's exactly the same size that I can always like duplicate back over that's just all about trees, and then one that's just all about the aggregate, and then one that's just all about the people. Because it, it, do, it, it, it helps you to avoid what is one of the biggest issues that I really saw in everybody's drawings last week, which is, you, you get thrown off. You put a bench in, and you put that bench in, it looks really nice, it's warped right into the spot, and you put your person in, and you're like, ooh, I really like how that person looks. But they don't look good together, because like, the person's too short, and it's like a giant bench, because they looked really nice in the composition together. But, but they didn't merge with each other, whereas if you were just looking at your base image, you were looking at your perspective and giving them each the consideration that they deserve, then they should work unto themselves. And as soon as you would duplicate them over and put them on the same file together, you'd see them brand new together and you'd be like, oh no, those don't match. You know, because you get, you get blinded staring at these photo reels because everything's realistic and you think it looks great, you know, because it's like a real bench, it's a real tree. But that real tree has the exact opposite lighting that the person has, so you just didn't see that. And so stopping to realize those things is really important. And so jumping back and forth um, between different working files can be very helpful. Um, one thing I did discover, though, to, the, to this effect that is really powerful in Photoshop, um, does anybody use layer comps? 
no layer covers. Cool. Well, I will introduce you to layer comps. You, where are layer comps? Under the window, you have layer comps. And you know what? I, I, I love layer comps. Um, I love layer comps primarily for two reasons. One, it's, it's good for workflow. But, um, but two, you can use them in object layer options in InDesign. So as I go through and I set up layer comps, if anybody's a CAD person, this is like setting up uh, different visibility settings. Uh, what's the terminology? Um, anyway, uh, you can just, you can always refer to these. So say I want to create a new layer comp that is with all these trees off. Hit a new layer comp, say trees off. Okay. Now I do one with just the trees, and this time I'm going to turn everything else off except for the base layer, the baseline work. Trees. Hit OK. Great. So now I can go back to my trees off, as you see. Now I can go to my trees, or I can go to the last document state. Oh, it's the same thing. So you can jump back and forth. So that's the way I'd do it if you're going to be doing it. But honestly, it's just that when, once these get complicated, like there's just way too many layers. So those are layer comps, really handy. Like I said, um, if you're into InDesign and you place a Photoshop document into InDesign, um, not only is object layer options better with Photoshop because you can actually twirl down all of the subgroups. You can twirl all of them down in object layer options in InDesign, but you can use layer comps. And it's just, it's right below the, the settings for that. So. I have a question about uh, object layer options. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to overlay uh, some of the trees with kind of distorted axon, mm -hmm. and I found that um, things were kind of distorted, or like things were jumping all, jumping all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Is there a way to fix that? Can you throw a fill layer on to Yes, you need to, um, you need to, when you start with your artboard, just the very first thing you do is you have a base layer that is one big box that is even bigger than your artboard if it wants to be, that is empty in the center. And I would put like a stroke on the outside, yeah. but just off of your artboard so, so you would never end up seeing it. Have it the bottom layer and always leave it on. And then when you place things in, then object layer options will always interpret the base image to be exactly the same size every time. And that's, yeah, that's a huge issue. So, and then also there again, if you change your layers, you're just done for and you have to start over. So, only jump in when you're ready to commit. And I did this a lot. I had to make a bunch of maps. I did everything in Photoshop, and then I had to go in and change it. And luckily, I'd used object layer options. That I was able to update it really quick and kind of turn scales on and, and, and just nuance all the different Photoshop files within InDesign. Really, really paid off. So, how are we doing on time? Do you guys want to take a five minute break? Okay. Okay. I gotta figure out how to make this screen happy. Yeah. It's really hard to work on. Yeah.